me, sir? Hear me? Okay, great. Uh, so good afternoon to everybody or good evening. I'm not sure exactly what time it is where you are. Um, I'm very excited to be able to speak at such a great festival. I want to extend my thanks to the organizers of the festival for inviting me to speak. I'm actually currently in Rio de Janeiro and not Sao Paulo, although it's very close. And I wish I could be there with you actually, because the event sound fantastic. I had the ability to listen to a couple of the speeches while I was waiting and I'm very honored to be a part. I am particularly happy whenever I'm invited to speak these days about the Snowden reporting that we did back in 2013 and, and 2014 and what relevance those revelations have for today, but also the relevance of the events that surrounded the reporting, what relevance they have for today as well, because in a lot of ways, 2013 and 2014, although it's only seven or eight years ago, seems like, at least to me, many lifetimes ago. I think in this political and journalistic world that is mediated through the speed of the internet, seven and eight years actually is in many ways lifetimes ago. And a lot has happened that is relevant to the Snowden reporting in the few years since we did it, the reporting started in June of 2013, went into 2014, 2015, even into 2016. We did the reporting in partnership with almost two dozen media outlets in multiple countries around the world. And it had a enormous impact on how people perceived their right to privacy, how they perceived the role of the United States in the world, how they perceived a free press and the role that it plays, how they perceived the abuse of power that governments engage in whenever they exercise power in the dark. But a lot happened since then that in, had a lot of effect, in some ways reversed the reaction to the reporting. When we first did the reporting, so much of the world was shocked because the materials that Edward Snowden provided to us were clearly shocking. I think it's important to remember the scope of, of what they revealed. What they basically revealed was that the United States and its four English-speaking surveillance allies in the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand had essentially converted the internet into a place of limitless spying, not just spying on terrorists or criminals or enemy governments, but spying on essentially the entire world on democratically elected leaders allied with the US government, on UN commissions, on trade negotiations, on UN investigations, spying for every conceivable motive for diplomatic advantage, financial advantage, political advantage. A small portion of it actually was devoted to the cause in which it was justified, which was terrorism. And I think if, when people ask me to this day, what was the most shocking document you saw or what was the most significant story that you did, it's hard to single one out. So what I always say is that the NSA had a motto that it used in thousands of its secret documents that we as journalists were able to go through. Just like corporations have a motto that they present to the public that's supposed to define what they are and who they are and what their brand is and what their role is in the world. The NSA also has, or at least had a motto that described its institutional mission. That motto was collect it all, not collect all the terrorist conversations or collect some communications, it was collect it all. And by that, what they meant, and they said this explicitly, was the goal of the NSA and their four partner surveillance agencies in the West was to collect and monitor and then store and analyze every form of human communication and all human activity that takes place digitally online, which is another way of saying without exaggeration or without hyperbole or dramatic interpretation that the goal of the NSA was to eliminate privacy in the digital age. Their view is that nothing that you do online should be outside of their grasp. They should be able to monitor everything. 
and collect and store and analyze everything. And that privacy really is not something you're entitled to as a human right, as a political right, as a legal right against the United States government. That is what these documents show that they revealed. And this was not some far off distant dream, a pipe dream. This was very close to becoming a reality. The NSA's own documents show that they collect billions, billions of emails and online chats and searches and browsing histories every single day from all over the world, billions, with no court supervision for each individual person they're targeting, with very little court supervision, even when they're targeting Americans. They essentially have free reign to do whatever it is that they wanted to do. And obviously, the world was shocked by that, and people were angry about it. They were demanding legislative reforms. There were breaches in diplomatic relations between countries on which the US was spying, such as Germany and Brazil and other countries. And there was a real uh, campaign to re rejuvenate the idea of privacy, to create encryption instruments that would allow you to use the internet without the ability of the US government to spy on you, to put an electronic wall between you and, and the US government. There were pressure campaigns on the biggest Silicon Valley companies like Facebook and Google and Apple and Microsoft and Yahoo, because part of the revelations were that those companies were collaborating with the US government, were handing over enormous amounts of their customer data. And there was a big pressure campaign to have these companies prove that they were willing to protect the privacy of their customers rather than violate it. And so a lot changed because of public anger. But very quickly, there was an interesting dynamic I witnessed, which is that the government found ways to turn back that, that anger, to restore faith in the security services of the United States. Almost immediately after we the Snowden reporting was at its peak, the United States announced that there was a grave new threat in the Middle East called ISIS that was a grave threat to the security of all Americans, that spying was needed even more than ever in order to protect Americans and Westerners against this new threat, worse than Al-Qaeda. In 2016, there were all kinds of political changes in the democratic world. There was obviously the election of Donald Trump in the United States. There was Brexit, the referendum in the United Kingdom in which British citizens decided to leave the EU. There were the election of people perceived as radical throughout the democratic world, Duterte in the Philippines, Jair Bolsonaro here in Brazil. And there was an attempt to isolate a foreign villain to blame all of this on. And in the United States, when Hillary Clinton lost and Donald Trump won, the decision was made to blame Russia, to claim that Russia was a grave threat to Western democracies and American freedom. And so right after people were scared of ISIS, then they were scared of Russia. And now, obviously, with this new war, people are more scared than ever, placing even more faith in Western governments and in Western military uh, agencies. And that, in a lot of ways, has restored people's faith in the idea that the government should be spying on people all over the world. And so you see this kind of give and take, this push and pull about the narrative. I'm not suggesting the United States government orchestrated any of that. I'm just saying that they were able to exploit these events to reverse the changes in public opinion that the Snowden story brought about. So I want to just spend a few time, a few minutes talking about the key lessons of what I believe are what were the key lessons from the Snowden story. And obviously, I think when people remember the Snowden story, and I heard this in the introduction, people think most about the invasion of privacy that it revealed and questions about why privacy matters. And that definitely was obviously a major part of the story, the fact that all of our privacy had been invaded in ways we had no idea was being done. And I want to get to that in a minute. But for me, the, there was a bigger point to the Snowden story, a bigger lesson, which was that the revelations were not so much about privacy as they were about democracy. Not so much why does privacy matter, but what does democracy mean? And do we really have democracy? And I say that because if you think about the decision that was made by the United States government over the course of several years under President Obama, to turn the internet into a system of mass surveillance where everyone was being spied on. It's hard to overstate how significant of a decision that was that was made by the US government. 
it took this technological innovation called the internet, which in the 1990s, if you read the literature about why we should be excited by the internet, why people were celebrating it, it talked about how it was going to be an unprecedented tool of liberation and empowerment, that it was going to free us for the first time from control by central state and corporate power. That was the idea. It was supposed to be liberating, the greatest liberatory technology ever invented. And what the United States government and its allies did, the Snowden reporting revealed, was turn it into its exact opposite. They took this promising technology and they turned it from the greatest tool of liberation into the greatest tool of coercion and surveillance ever known in human history. And whatever your views are on that, that you're in favor of surveillance, you're against it, you have to acknowledge that's an incredibly important and consequential decision for the US government to have made. And what was so striking to me about that decision and about what the reporting revealed was that this decision was made completely in secret. There was no democratic debate about whether Americans or the British or Australians or Canadians or New Zealanders wanted their government to do that. There was no discussion or vote about whether that should happen because no one knew that it had, had been decided. In fact, it was done with such secrecy that not even key members of these governments knew anything about what had been done. I remember very early on after we began the Snowden reporting, a member of the British parliament who wasn't just any member of the British parliament, he was on several committees of national security and his role as a member of parliament was to oversee spying agencies and military agencies to ensure that what they were doing was complying with the law of the United Kingdom. And he wrote an op-ed in The Guardian in I think August or September of 2013, which you can go and read, in which he said that even he, a member of the key committees that are supposed to monitor these agencies had no idea that the British government was engaged in mass spying to this extent, that he learned about it for the first time by reading our stories in The Guardian and in other news outlets around the world. And so often I heard from officials in the United States Congress, in the Canadian Parliament, in Australia, New Zealand, say the same thing, that they had no idea, not even the elected officials we, we put in power to monitor this, none of them had any idea this had been done. It had been done completely in secret. And so when you think about that, the fact that the United States government, the Canadian government, the British government, the Australian and New Zealand government, all of which say that they're democracies and which have the ritualistic trappings of democracy, you, you, they let citizens go to a booth every four years and they present two names and you get to punch a hole next to one of those two names and whoever has more holes gets the most votes and wins the election and goes into office. It seems like a democracy. That sounds like what we're taught is democracy, but if the most important decisions by our government are being made without our knowing about it, how meaningful is this process, this voting process? We, we can't make decisions about who we want to remove from power and who we want to keep in power because we have no idea what they're doing. Now, obviously, there are some things the government should keep secret, specific movements of troops or military contracts in a time of war. You don't want your enemy knowing where your troops are moving. There's some things that the government should keep secret, but not these broad decisions about the most crucial and fundamental questions, such as do we want to turn the internet into a tool of mass surveillance? And that that was exactly what was done. And I think it's worth asking how meaningful of a democracy do we have if the most important decisions are getting made without any democratic debate or accountability, without all completely outside the democratic framework? Doesn't that make democracy more illusory than real. That I think is a critical lesson that needs to be applied today because it continues to be the case that in the name of war or terrorism or crime or security, so much of what our governments do, our democratic governments do, is done completely in the dark without anyone knowing about it. Now, I do wanna talk a little bit about privacy because obviously that is a crucial part of the Snowden story. And I described earlier the extent to which it had been invaded as these documents showed. And I remember there being lots of questions at the time 
of people who said the following, look, I may not want my government spying on everybody, including me, and I may not support it, but ultimately I'm not a terrorist. I'm not a criminal. I'm not a pedophile. I'm just kind of a boring person. I just go to work and I live my life and I use the internet to buy plane tickets or presents for my grandkids. Why do I really care if the government is spying on me? And this is an idea that privacy doesn't matter that has also been pushed by Facebook and Google. The chairman and, and, and founder of, of, of Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, famously said that privacy is no longer a social norm in this new age. And the CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt said, if you're doing something you don't want anyone to know about, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. And yet the reality is all of us as human beings crave privacy naturally. We all put bed blocks and, and use locks on our bedroom and bathroom doors. We put passwords on our social media accounts. There are things we want our spouse or our psychiatrist or our doctor or our best friend to know that we wouldn't want anyone else to know. We're constantly making choices about what we want to keep secret, about where we can go and do things in secret, because studies show that in order to really be a free human being, you have to know that there are places you can go and things you can say and things you can do without constantly being monitored and judged or having the ability to be monitored and judged. If we as human beings know that at all times are being watched, if we lose the zone of privacy, our behavior changes radically. When we know that we're being watched, our decisions much more are the byproduct, not of our own agency and our own choice, but of the expectations of society around us. And that's the reason why only in a zone of privacy, in that zone, is where things like dissent and creativity and exploration exclusively reside. A watch society breeds conformity. It breeds submission. It breeds homogeneity. And so even if you're not a person who is a rebel against the government or a dissident or committing crimes, you still have a lot of interest in preserving the right to privacy, which these programs were eliminating and to a large extent still are. Everywhere you go, everything you, everything you do, everyone with whom you speak, every penny that you spend is all being tracked and monitored and stored. And when that happens, we lose a great deal about what it means to be a free human being. So the last point I wanted to make uh, about the Snowden story and the lessons that it taught us was I think it also changed a great deal how people perceive of the role of the United States government in the world. Remember at the time of this reporting, it was 2013 when we began, President Obama had been president for four or five full years. And a lot of the spying programs that we revealed were implemented under his presidency. And there was a change in perception about the United States before Obama was elected, when George Bush and Dick Cheney were running the United States, when they were doing things like invading Iraq, and instituting a torture program and creating a camp at Guantanamo where people were held without charges. It was a change in, in the, the view of the United States. And, and the idea was, well, maybe the United States is not a force for good in the world any longer. Maybe it's a force for bad. And when George Bush and Dick Cheney were replaced by Barack, Barack Obama, huge numbers of people, millions in Europe and Latin America and all over the world said, oh, now the United States is back to being good. We like, this is a person we identify with, we like. And I remember people being shocked, asking me all the time, why would President Obama, who ran on a campaign of eliminating these programs, not of extending them, be so aggressively invested in expanding them? And I think what people finally came to realize is that the United States government as an entity, regardless of who runs it, regardless of who wins elections, acts in accordance with certain principles. Those principles being, they will always do what they need to do to maximize their own power and advance their own interests, regardless of legal constraints or moral and ethical limits or whatever other conventions they oppose on other countries because the United States government has long been and continues to be the most powerful country in the world. And with that power comes the ability to do whatever it wants. And I think the realization that that's true, not just when there's a Republican or a right-wing president like George Bush and Dick Cheney, but even a nice, sophisticated, seemingly progressive person like Barack Obama changed the perception around the world of what the role of the United States, the function of the United States really is. So 
that's the overview of the lessons that I think the reporting taught. I think, it, as I said, taught us a lot of other things about the crucial nature of journalism when it's done correctly, when it investigates and is adversarial to those in power rather than subservient to it. I think it taught a lot about how human beings will abuse their power. They can exercise it in the dark. But those three core lessons to me are the three key lessons about democracy, about privacy, about the role of the United States government. And those lessons are as relevant now as when we first began doing the reporting back in 2013. So with that, I want to thank all of you for listening. And once again, I want to extend my thanks to the festival organizers for asking me to speak. And I hope you have a great rest of the event. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Snowden. Thanks for participating in the Ideas Festival Puebla 2022. Uh, how is the weather in Brazil? It's good as always. You can see it behind me here. Um, and once again, muchas gracias for everybody. Thank you. And remember, they're watching you. Uh, that's exactly the point. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. All right, bye-bye. Muchas gracias al señor Glenn Greenwald.